Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation in our 2022 Covey Lecture Series. My name is Jocelyn Titone, and I'll be your moderator today. You may also see my colleague Doug popping in and out as he'll be helping with the technical end of things. Our lecture will run about 50 minutes today, and we'll have a question and answer period following that. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat feature at any time, and we will share them at the end. I'm very pleased to welcome Vonda Pravado, Chief Marketing and Digital Officer with the LCBO, and Abhay Garg, Vice President of Merchandising with the LCBO, as our speakers today. Vonda is a brand transformation leader who has held leadership roles with premier retailers and brands. In her role with the LCBO, she leads the marketing, customer experience, and e-commerce teams, as well as food and drink. Before joining the LCBO, Vonda was Vice President Marketing and Category for Second Cup Limited, where she spearheaded the company's brand transformation. She has held prior roles as Vice President Marketing with Indigo Books and AOL Canada Inc. Vonda is an active member of the marketing industry, having served as a judge in competitions, including Marketing Magazine's Top 30 Under 30 and Strategy Magazine Agency of the Year, and has been a member of the Centennial College Advertising and Marketing Program Advisory Committee since 2015. Abhay has more than 17 years of experience in retail and has held positions at Loblaws, Target, and Sears. He's held many progressive roles in inventory planning, merchandising, demand planning, and has also led some of the largest system implementation projects in retail. Prior to leading merchandising at the LCBO, Abhay was most recently the Vice President of Inventory Planning and Quality Assurance at LCBO, leading the creation and implementation of inventory strategies across the LCBO network. Abhay is an engineer and has a master's degree in computer science from State University of New York. Today, our two guests from the LCBO are going to share a lecture titled Ontario Beverage Alcohol Evolution and Trends. So with that, I'll hand it over to you and you can go ahead. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, before I start, I want to express our thanks for being invited to the COVID lecture series. Uh, we are very excited to spend the next hour with you. Uh, you'll have to bear with me with the slide movement here because there's too many things I'm handling at the same time. Hopefully, I'll do it right today. Okay, so on the next slide, you can see that we've put together a bit of an agenda for our time together to guide our presentation. We'll start off with details on how LCBO has evolved over the years, and we'll share some LCB Ontario beverage alcohol market sales. We are very focused on our consumer, and so we'll talk about the insights we have gathered and how that is impacting the trends in the industry. And then we'll share LCBO support for innovation and other growth priorities. We also have some time at the end of the questions, as Jocelyn mentioned, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. So with that, let's go to the next slide. Uh, as you may not be aware, but LCBO, it used to be called Liquor Control Board of Ontario, has a long history within Ontario dating back over 90 years. In early 1800s, Ontario's earliest pubs and microbreweries started opening. Pubs served as meeting places for growing communities where people used to get together for a refreshing beverage or stage coaches to change horses. Uh, some of these pubs actually doubled as churches, uh, military garrisons, and town halls for early settlers. Uh, in 1811, uh, it, is, it is recognized as a start of local winemaking in Mississauga, Ontario. Johann Schiller, originally from Germany, started the first Ontario commercial winery. In the 19, 1860s, the American Civil War brings a halt to whiskey production in the U.S., and the Canadian whiskey becomes the beverage alcohol of choice of North America. Um, I think, if I'm not wrong, Queen Victoria is said to have enjoyed a glass of Canadian whiskey every night for medicinal purposes, uh, bringing global acclaim to the Canadian whiskey. And I think my grandmother still believes in that. Um, in 1914, to help the water for beverage alcohol was restricted. Uh, the restriction grows to a prohibition on alcoholic beverages under the Ontario Temperance Act. Only Ontario wine was still legal uh, for sale. Uh, and the demand for Ontario wine is so intense that the producers started to water it down and the quality really suffered at that time. In 1927, prohibition ended and the government established Liquor Control Board of Ontario, opening 16 stores uh, that were increased to 86 stores by the end of the year. Three mail order departments and four warehouses and liquor permits costing $2 were required to buy alcohol. In 1930s, LCBO stores expanded services throughout the province. 
at this time, prohibition was still in effect in US. So a lot of American tourists would come to Ontario for their holidays. In 1961, permits required for purchase of liquor were abolished. And LCNU tripled this number of stores by the early 1960s and introduced the first wine consultants, which a lot of you know now as product consultants. And as we move in the 90s, early part of the century, where we were focused on becoming a customer first organization. We built stores that create a compelling and inviting retail experience where customers are engaged, encouraged to shop the world of uh, beverage alcohol. Uh, and LCBO is still the primary destination for beverage alcohol in the province, but all that was about to change. In the last decade, as many of you know, we have seen major reform in the terms of beverage alcohol market in Ontario. <laughs> The Ontario government has steadily been opening up the market, increasing access, making shopping for wine and beer more convenient for Ontarians. So on the next slide, I have a bit of a video for about two minutes uh, that really showcases the evolution of LCBO. And for that to work properly, I have to turn off my video and do this. Okay, I think I'm back, but my video should be coming up anytime now. And I apologize for the quality of the video. I think you're having a bit of a technical challenge today. Um, okay, so on this slide, this is fresh, uh, fresh off our press. This is a latest published annual report results for fiscal 2021. I can comment that we managed to achieve a new milestone in our sales, stopping 7.1 billion. As you might may be aware, we work very hard to have efficient operations to transfer as much as possible to back to the province. Our last transfer amount was uh, just close to uh, just over 2.4 billion. Uh, in terms of the largest uh, larger market in Ontario, sales are also realized through beer store, distillery, brewery, winery, retail stores. And through the more than 677 retail stores, catalogs, e-commerce, special order services, almost 400 LCBO convenience outlets, which provide cost-effective convenience, socially responsible access for rural consumers, as, and as a wholesaler to almost 450 grocery stores, LCBO offers more than 28,000 products annually from more than 80 countries. We actually move products for more than 80 countries all over the world. As one of the largest retailers of beverage alcohol, we are uniquely positioned to significantly influence consumers and industry to encourage a culture of sustainability. We believe it's the LCBO's responsibility to lead by example and take action. This is why we are integrating uh, sustainability across our business and recognizing our good partners who are doing the same. And you'll hear about it later on today. Uh, and whether it's through diversity, inclusion, community investment, or environmental practices. With that, I'm going to pass it off to Wanda to talk a little bit about our 
mission and vision. Thanks, Abe. Good morning, everyone. We're just going to take a closer look at um, LCBO's position in the market today. <clears throat> I'm getting a little bit of feedback. I don't know what maybe you have to turn off your mic, Abe. Mm, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Or I'm getting feedback from someone. Anyway, so our, our mission uh, is to be best in class, customer first, responsible retailer and wholesaler, supporting our local communities and delivering value to Ontarians. I mean, can you hear me? Clearly? You're not hearing feedback, are you? Okay, great. Um, and our mission is to deliver remar remarkable experiences as a trusted destination for the world's wine buyers and spirits. We can go to the next slide. So, so last, last year, year, we refreshed our brand promise, and this was based on some research that we conducted, and it was really to better reflect what matters most to customers in their relationship with the LCBO. So our brand promise of perfect choices made easy, moments made great, is supported by five brand pillars. They're connect, reward, discover, impact, and inspire. And doing all of this is expert for our customers. We're going to play a brief video for you. Hopefully, it'll play clearly. It'll help. Uh, it'll help you see how our brand promise comes to life. Since its inception over 90 years ago, the LCBO has grown to become a globally recognized leader in beverage alcohol as a buyer, distributor, and retailer. As the market changes and customers' expectations evolve, our focus remains on being a best-in-class, responsible retailer and wholesaler by putting the customer first, supporting our local communities, and delivering value to Ontarians. We are evolving our brand promise, what customers can uniquely expect to receive every time they interact with us. Perfect choices made easy, moments made great. On the surface, it means we make it easy for our customers to find that IPA they loved at the local brewery, the best vodka for cocktail night, or the perfect Pinot Noir for family dinner. Beyond that, it refers to everything, from the ease of shopping online and the helpfulness of all our employees, to having a positive impact on Ontario and building strong relationships with our people and partners. Our brand promise comes to life through five brand pillars. We help Ontarians find the perfect pour by helping them discover one of the largest selections of beer, wine, and spirits in the world. We connect them with the right information and products so they can make the right choice with confidence every time. We inspire them in store, in print, and online with exciting and immersive shopping experiences unique to the LCBO. We are always ready to help when and where they want us with friendly and consistent expertise that rewards them for their trust and loyalty. And finally, we'll demonstrate our shared values to customers by continuing to make a positive impact on their lives through the contributions we make to Ontario and our Spirit of Sustainability platform. These five pillars will be essential to bringing our new brand promise to life. But it's not just what we do, it's how we do it. Every interaction is guided by our new brand personality, your friendly and helpful go-to expert. Regardless of your role at the LCBO, you'll play a part in enriching the lives of Ontarians by delivering on our new brand promise of perfect choices made easy, moments made great. And that's something worth raising a glass to. So this is a video that we use both internally and externally really to help educate employees and partners about our brand. I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the discover pillar. So these areas really represent the most relevant and compelling aspects of the beverage uh, alcohol category for our customers today and where we're really focusing our efforts. So it's about new and exciting products and trends that we bring to our customers and really positions us as the expert. Uh, supporting local industry and businesses, and that's a trend that really has intense, intensified during the pandemic. Smart options, which is really about, you know, giving customers, uh, you know, choices for what they're looking for. And today that's more and more about lighter choices, and you'll hear more about that in a little while. 
uh, premium, which you'll also hear more about, really it's about not drinking more. It's actually about drinking less, but drinking better quality. And then good value, um, making sure that we're presenting customers with good options at a good price point, which is going to become even more important in challenging economic times. Um, and as I said, you'll hear more about this when we talk about trends a little later in the presentation. Uh, social responsibility, which Abbe touched on earlier, is really at the core of LCBO's mandate for the past 90 years, and it's the foundation of our impact uh, brand pillar. In 2018, we actually started on a journey to develop a social impact platform uh, because we really wanted to evolve our understanding of social responsibility and take more of a holistic approach. So Spirit of Sustainability really is the output of that work. And it's our bold commitment to drive meaningful and equitable change in our communities, lead the industry in sustainable practices and take better care of the planet. And all of this really uh, for the good of Ontario. And there's three areas that make up spirit of sustainability or platform. It's the area of good people, good planet and good partnerships. And again, we'll talk more about this a little later in the presentation. And another really important commitment is to support diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity, not just at the LCBO, but in our industry overall. And we've taken a number of actions here, and it's really about forging great partnerships, like the partnership we have with the Center for Young Black Professionals, the Black North Initiative, the CEO pledge that we took, um, really looking at some of the charitable organizations that we work with, whether that's supporting Pride, which we do every single year, um, and making sure that we're reflecting diversity and inclusion in all of our marketing efforts and in the content that we publish. I'll turn it back to Abby. Thank you, Rhonda. Sorry about that. I have to transition between microphone mutes and slide changes. So, okay, so let's start off by looking at um, our uh, Ontario beverage alcohol market sales uh, for the past year. So looking uh, at or this particular slide, you can see that overall total merchandising, we are growing year over year by 1.4%. Now, Spirits and RTD had a huge explosive growth in the last few years. Uh, and we saw that, uh, that people were really gravitating towards RTD and spirits. Uh, but with the pre as we saw with the pre-pandemic turns, the trends, the wine category is starting to lose a bit of share to uh, spirits and RTD. Uh, on the rolling 13, that which you see on this particular slide, uh, wines represent 23% of the LCB of business, uh, which has dec uh, decreased a little bit by 123 basis points. Vintages, which is a premium uh, category, uh, represents 9% of our market share and has grown by 58 basis points. And this aligns with the premiumization we are seeing in the industry. And you'll hear a little bit about it later on uh, from me and Wanda on it. On this particular side, we'll be looking market share by wine buyers. So we really divide up our wine buyers as Ontario, New World and European. Um, and we are seeing a normalization in domestic and uh, New World wines shopping patterns uh, close to pre-pandemic shopping. Uh, during pandemic, we really saw a huge amount of support for the domestic uh, industry and where a lot of customers were moving towards local. And But we have started to see a bit of a slowdown compared to the incredible growth we saw earlier and at the height of the pandemic. Uh, what we are seeing is a normalization of inflated sales in the domestic and the new world portfolios. Uh, the most notable change is European portfolio, which is showing an increase of market share by 192 basis points. And what is driving this growth in Euro European portfolio? And I'll touch a little bit about it later on. Uh, it's really about the rosé and sparkling. Uh, the customers are really gravitating towards champagne. If you were uh, reading any news article in the last couple of years, what you saw was uh, there was champagne shortage all over the world uh, because really people are moving towards the Proseccos, the rosé Proseccos, the uh, champagnes of the world. And that has actually helped the European uh, uh, um, category to grow. Uh, in the last uh, year. And, and in our domestic portfolio, VQA is taking share from IDV and non-VQA. Red, Rosé and Sparkling are key drivers within the VQA segment as IDV is slowing down versus last year growth trends. Overall, VQA represents 34% of the domestic portfolio and has seen an increase of around 159 basis points. IDB, we saw a tremendous growth in large formats, the uh, bag in a box uh, from last year has softened and 
now tending to blow, slow down a little bit. Uh, and it represents 59% of the domestic portfolio and actually has lost uh, 204 basis points. So vintages, this uh, uh, slide talks a little bit about the vintages uh, wine market share. As many of you are probably aware, a vintages business is made up of uh, a couple of different uh, categories. So one is a, a one of a kind biweekly releases that gets released every two weeks and essentials uh, that are available all the time to our customers that these are tried and tested and LCBO back products. Uh, Vintage is a premium wine business has seen continued growth at 7.7% or a year over year. Uh, and that kind of aligns again with people wanting to drink better liquid. Uh, we see that our essentials portfolio has taken share over the course of the year as the customers are gravitating towards more tried and true brands. And we saw that during pandemic when people didn't want to go into the stores, uh, they picked up what they were aware of. They knew the essentials that they were confident about and they picked that product up. Now, our vintages releases did suffer a bit of share loss during this time frame in favor of essentials and goes back to what we saw during pandemic. Uh, the discovery was a little slower. People didn't want to try out different wines and niche products just because they hadn't, they didn't get an opportunity to look at the bottle in the store, touch the bottle. Uh, so they gravitated more towards essentials. Uh, the Ontario vintages buyer is down 26 basic basis points in the last 13 uh, periods. But in recent periods, we have actually seen strong results as customers are gravitating towards more premium local wines. And ice wine, which has suffered a lot in the last couple of years, has started to uh, stabilize a little bit. And this is where uh, we wanted to pull something together to kind of showcase how customers were reacting to price points. So if you really look at this graph, and I would take your focus towards the two green arrows we have there, uh, parentheses actually, uh, you see that in LCBO wines, the $15 to $20 and the $25 and above actually grew drastically. Uh, people are moving towards more premium wine, and we saw similar uh, growth in the uh, in the vintages category as well. Over 15 or to 25 and 25 to 50 and 50 and above grew by 22%. Uh, and that kind of growth all directs us towards uh, the premiumization. Now, we also know this very well that, uh, you know, the inflation is high uh, and the customer might not be able to spend the same amount of money they have in the past. But what LCBO does is really provide those options, even in the value segment. So if the customer is not able to afford that premium wine, they do have options available within the LCBO assortment. With that, I'm going to pass it off to Wanda to talk a little bit about consumer insights and industry trends. Great. So with that backdrop, I guess, on some of the trends that have been shaping category sales, we want to take a closer look at how consumer insights are shaping some of the trends that we're seeing in the industry and shaping LCBO priorities. Um, so from an overall market perspective, the pandemic really created some shifts in shopping behaviors, which initially were driven by convenience and safety. Um, so, for example, the grocery channel experienced really strong growth, and that was primarily due to the fact that customers were consolidating their shopping trips. Similarly, we saw customers took more to buying <clears throat> direct from producers, agents, and through delivery services. And like many industries, we saw significant growth in online shopping with pickup in store and curbside options made available to customers. Um, we also experienced an expansion of access points for customers. So takeout and delivery from restaurants and bars and from bottle shops as well. And the assortment of options in other channels we know is also something that continues to evolve. Uh, grocery stores, you know, for instance, have seen growth in the number of options that are available to purchase in that channel. And we know that they'll continue to be uh, evolution here in the future as well. And then if we take a look at, you know, the consumer mindset, the pandemic and, you know, current affairs, like the crisis that's happening in Ukraine right now, all those things really have an impact on the Canadian consumer's mindset. And of course, it influences their attitudes and their behaviors with beverage alcohol. 
So on this slide, we just highlight a few of those. Um, probably one of the biggest ones being hybrid shopping. And this is really the integration of the online and the physical shopping channels. So it includes things like, you know, using the online channel to find products that you're looking for before you visit the store or to shop online and pick up in store. Um, you know, a lot of people were avoiding coming into stores entirely when COVID uh, cases started to spike. And with the ongoing supply chain challenges that we have, we expect to see cons consumers continue to turn to the online channel first to look for inventory before they head out on their shopping, uh, on their shopping trips. Uh, more online shopping obviously means higher customer service expectations from this channel. Uh, you just have to take a look at what's happening with uh, Amazon, which is really you know, driving the market in terms of what people are expecting. Do they want to be able to get what they want, when they want, and how they want? Uh, while many consumers had higher discretionary income during the pandemic, either because, you know, travel restrictions, restaurant closures meant they had, you know, more money to spend else, elsewhere. Uh, now, when we take a look at things, we also have to consider that a lot of people are worried about inflation, rising costs, which means that they're going to be looking for value options as well. Mental health and wellness awareness and importance is something else that has grown and consumers are being much more thoughtful in their choices. And that includes moderation. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that in the coming slides. And finally, you know, you've heard a lot about local. Abby's been talking about local and the desire to support local products and businesses became even more important during the pandemic. And so all of this, as I said, really influences people's um, behaviors and attitudes towards beverage alcohol. So where we want to go next is what does this all mean in terms of trends? And so we want to take a closer look at five trends that are really um, shaping our industry today. Thank you, Wanda. And, you know, I, I spoke about premiumization at least five times in the last few slides, uh, you know, but there is a huge growth in premium and ultra premium price points. As customers are staying in more often uh, and not dining out as frequently, they're increasingly willing to spend a little bit more money on a better bottle with better liquid as a treat for themselves uh, or, you know, at a new at home celebration, uh, you know, after, you know, they want to do with their family. Uh, customers are less frivolous on their spending in general, uh, and they want to know that the what they're drinking is a quality product, and they're willing to spend for it. And we have thus seen an explosive growth in premium, ultra premium product offerings like champagne, Bordeaux, Super Tuscans, etc. Also, we are seeing customer behavior when we release this customer behavior when we release our online special offers, uh, which comes up uh, in our classics collection. Sometimes these offers are sold within minutes when we release it. So it really all directs, goes towards what Wanda kind of mentioned is the move towards premiumization. Uh, and, you know, LCBO wants to provide options to the customer uh, if they're moving towards that, uh, you know, price point that they have options available. And what we you can see on this slide is really, um, if we take a closer look specifically at vintages, spirits, and what we call our general list wines, and it really is just a comparison on the growth rates across the different price points. So you can see the lower cost items de decreased while items that were priced uh, $15 or more for, for wines and $20 or more for, for spirits is really where we saw the growth. And then something that Manda, Wanda mentioned earlier, you know, moderation and lighter choices and options. Lighter choices and moderation is also on the top, top of mind for all our customers. You know, customers want uh, better for you options uh, without sacrificing any taste or lighter options. Uh, we have seen an increasing trend towards lighter al dealkalized uh, wines, lower sugar, lower calorie options. Our suppliers are bringing forward more innovation as the area grows. Uh, you know, we, we did, we really wanted to see how customer responds to this. So last year we did a test in 11 stores where we merchandised uh, lighter options uh, that was either uh, uh, low al dealkalized uh, or um, low sugar options in a secondary area with a proper signage and some education behind it. And we actually saw those 11 stores uh, deliver 27% increase in sales, confirming that the customers love having different choices if we are able to provide and show it showcase it to them 
And what you see on this graph is a, a bit of a comparison between RTD spirits, wine, and beer. So the last, the bottom two lines was orange and blue are uh, RTD and beer. And you see, they're not seeing the same amount of growth as wines and uh, spirits because RTD and beer kind of had a little bit of those options to start up. You, there's a lot of RTD options out there that were low sugar, low alcohol. Uh, but wines and spirits have seen huge innovation uh, growth in the last few uh, years. And that's why the growth there is much higher than what we have seen with spirits and as uh, with RTD and beer. And the data you see on this slide is actually from our own surveys. And what we are seeing is that, you know, over half of customers are saying that they always look for nutritional information when buying be beverage alcohol. More than half seek beverage alcohol products with low sugar content. We're also seeing growth in those that are seeking low and no alk, and we're seeing growing interest in organic. Can go to the next slide, Abe. Um, to help customers make more informed choices or the perfect choice, if you um, if you think about our brand promise, we're also testing a new shelf tag system. And um, the intention here is really to provide easy to understand scale of attributes. So it includes things like sweetness, body and sugar content about our different wine products to help customers, you know, make make the right choice for them. We're also seeing growth in the use of QR codes, both on product labels, and we've been using them more and more in our displays in store, uh, because these are a great way for people to use their mobile phones to get access to additional product information, such as origin or even, you know, um, uh, recommendations for mm -hmm. recipe pairings. And we really are seeing uh, customers now where they want to align their values with the brands they are supporting. So, you know, for example, uh, Pantagonia, which is known for really uh, the environment of supporting the environmental efforts and donated over $20 million. You know, the, we see the, uh, our, uh, uh, the customer really supporting them. And then in some, uh, a brand like A&W that really uh, is commits to reducing the environmental impact through the uh, packaging they use and the way they manage their energy and uh, waste uh, products. And then within our industry, a brand like Doug Brand from uh, California actually supports uh, uh, you know, BIPOC uh, George Brown culinary students for with a scholarship. So obviously our customers really want to support brands that are so aligned with their um, with their values. And, and you know, you can see an example here of uh, LCBO's effort uh, during our annual Pride campaign, uh, which you can see one of the very witty, uh, you know, graphics here. But besides all this, there is a huge affinity for local. Now more than ever, uh, the customer really wants to support the local wineries. They want to embrace anything that is being produced local, and it's driving sales in this very important category. Supporting local continues to be a top LCBO mandate, and the customer sentiment post-pandemic is here to stay. Local categories like VQA, craft beer, cider, spirits are projected to outpace overall category growth. Um, and then the next slide talks a little bit about packaging. And have you kind of spoke a little bit about how what a customer really uh, wants to uh, support brands that align with their values? And one of the things that they want to make sure is they have less carbon footprint. They're supporting the any sustainable uh, air, wine uh, packaging or anything that really helps the environment. So this, you know, despite the massive disruption that happened in 2020, cons consumers are not abandoning their commitment to sustainability. A significant majority continues to identify as an environmentally aware consumer and the younger customers are willing to pay more for products that are in sustainable packaging. Uh, I think we had a, a, you know, a stat there that 73% of the consumers say they're willing to pay more for a sustainable packaging a number that rises to 83% amongst the younger generations. So the world supply chain is sure getting a lot of attention these days. A dramatic increase in tall cans can cause more than few complications. Uh, I know one of the biggest uh, producer of uh, cans, actually the minimum orders went from uh, just over 200,000 cans to over a million cans now, because there's a huge uh, demand for it. And, and there is, um, 
a new generation of products that are aiming to shrink the carbon footprint of wine, spirits, and beer for a more sustainable future. Um, you know, there's a couple of options, uh, uh, pictures here which really talk about new packaging. I think I just want to point out uh, one of the world's first wine in a paper a bottle that was released in LCBO, uh, and it got, uh, garnered a lot of uh, media uh, in the last couple of weeks. So we are seeing uh, consumers still supporting their values and sustainable uh, industry, sustainable way of making uh, products is something they continue to support. And just a few data points here from our customer survey, you can see that, you know, approximately two thirds of our customers, they want to support local, they want to support, you know, environmentally friendly packaging and a growing trend is wanting to know the origin and the story behind the product and the producer. Um, and I think this is, you know, transparency. Uh, is driving a lot of this, uh, but also just general interest. I think people want to know the stories behind products and brands. On this next slide, you can just, uh, it's an example of how our spirit of sustainability program, uh, you know, we often feature the efforts of what our good partners are doing in our marketing campaigns. So this is a spread from one of our print publications that really just highlights and celebrates what some of our beverage alcohol brands are doing to give back to their communities, whether it's through donations or sponsorship of various uh, causes. Again, just more information for customers to make informed choices. And then some of the notable trends in wines that we are seeing currently. Rosé, th this is something that's growing by double digits. I remember when I was in the inventory planning uh, space, we used to plan for rosé to kind of die out after Thanksgiving weekend, but it doesn't have that seasonality anymore because it continues to grow even in the cooler months. And when a double digit growth happens, you know, the customer is really moving towards uh, that particular, uh, you know, type of uh, product. And then bubbles, and I'll share a little bit more details later on. It's an easy uh, drinking solution for a lot of uh, uh, consumers and they are not slowing. It's not slowing down. It is something that we we forecast to really buy more and our, uh, and our consumers still, uh, you know, we always uh, probably deliver less because there's still the growth that we are seeing there is just uh, over 58% over last year, which was unheard of in the last few years. And then uh, you have picture of Snoop Dogg here, but, you know, celebrity brands and social media mm -hmm. is another driving force in the wine category with more celebrities and influencers getting into the beverage alcohol space. Recently, we have had new wines from Snoop Dogg, Caitlin Pristow, Post Malone, Lady Gaga, Mary J. Blige, and the brands are hitting the market with a pent up demand. I mean, when you go on social media, you see uh, people just talking about the product, even though it's not even in the province yet, but there is a huge pent up demand that really helps up with the sales. And then let's not forget the convenient formats here. Uh, the uh, wine and cans can be easily chilled. A lot of people uh, now are okay, uh, you know, drinking their wine from a can because you know, as I said, it's more convenient and they're more portable and they're seeing a huge uh, growth in popularity. And obviously uh, a seltzer trend, and I'll share a little bit later on, is another area that the customer tends to uh, really gravitate towards. And it's it's really driven by the fact that, you know, they have a lot of options available in that category. So this is what I wanted to really share from a bubbles and uh, rosé trends. So, you can see the growth uh, trend of both uh, bubbles uh, and rosé. So the growth in sparkling category in the last few years, which has accelerated in the past 12 months, is coming primarily from the urban affluent uh, consumer aged uh, under 45, and principally the millennials and LDA Gen Z cohorts. Uh, the sparkling wine category in, category in Canada has been particularly successful in recruiting more millennial drinkers and rosé. Our uh, sales of rosé are growing in double digits. Um, group uh, consumption increased during the pandemic, especially uh, amongst a younger cohort. And you can see the graphs really showing the growth in both areas. And we just wanted to put together a slide kind of showcasing a, the few of the top celebrity brands that we actually saw in the last few uh, months. And just to give you a bit of an idea here, the celebrity brands have grown over, the brands represented by celebrity over 137 million in net sales this past year, which is up from the 109 million we delivered in the previous year. That's a 25% growth. And right now we have close to 120 SKUs. And the more we talk about the brands, the more celebrities are supporting the brands and they see this trend growing. 
And this slide talks a little bit about the RTD, the explosive growth in RTD. It's important to pay attention of the behaviors of younger consumers as the habits will increasingly shape the consumer patterns in the coming years. Uh, younger audiences drove the growth of RTD. The, I mean, if anybody followed any social media, you can see any new RTD, a white claw new flavor. Uh, it's really driven by a lot of younger uh, consumers who really drive the growth there. Uh, the convenient formats is great. There are lighter options available. And just as a, as a quick, um, you know, a start to share with you, as you do calls for RTD and new products, uh, three years ago, we used to get around 300, 400 new uh, submissions. Uh, but this this year, we are expecting over 1,400 new submissions for new RTD innovative products. So the, the growth is tremendous, and we see that in sales within that category. There's been a number of studies and reports done about younger audiences and their perceptions and attitudes towards beverage alcohol. And we think it's really important that we understand this. Um, even if we look at, you know, Gen Z versus the, the millennials, um, there's a big difference between them and, and what their perceptions are of this category. So Gen Z is looking for different experiences compared to millennials. Gen Z really looks to limit their alcohol intake in favor of saving money. Um, they find, you know, alcohol generally less appealing and they're more mindful of the side effects of alcohol, such as the effects on health and wellness, um, you know, general impact on their moods, which is less of a concern to the millennials. So um, when we look at their behaviors as well, compared to millennials, Gen Z shoppers on average make about five fewer trips to purchase beverage alcohol per year. Um, and they spend roughly 25% less on alcohol compared to millennials. So again, I think this is something we'll continue to watch and, and to watch the influences Abby was talking about of celebrity brands and social media on behaviors and attitudes of younger audiences. So we're going to turn now to talk about the fifth trend, which is really around omni-commerce. And as we talked about, you know, earlier, there's a real convergence of online and in-store shopping. So let's look at what that means for the LCBO. So we saw tremendous growth in our e-commerce channels uh, as a result of the pandemic. So 450% sales growth. You can go to the next slide, Abby. Um, and over 500% growth in customers shopping with us online. Um, at the onset of the pandemic, we introduced same-day pickup, so shop online, pick up in-store, and this was available in about 30% of our stores. And it continues to be a really popular option for customers today. Um, we know from research that post-pandemic, many customers are also telling us they're going to continue to shop with us in both channels because it provides um, you know, great convenience, but it also provides access to our full assortment. So there's a number of initiatives that are currently underway at the LCBO to make sure that we're delivering on customers uh, changing and growing needs from this omni-channel cha experience. So again, the ability to connect them with what they want, how and when they want it. And so we've got a new, actually got a new e-commerce platform that's launching this spring very soon. It's going to have enhanced features and functionality both for our website and for our mobile apps. We're also continuing to enhance the in-store shopping experience, and I'm going to walk you through one of our flagship stores. Um, and at the same time, we're also looking to expand same-day pickup into more of our, of our locations, and we're also looking at new uh, and convenient delivery options. So let's, uh, let's look at innovation and growth. Thank you, Wanda. So I, I wanted to share, you know, what, what are growth priorities within LCBO? So we definitely want to re be relevant. We want to make sure we are getting ahead of those trends. We are capturing what the customer is looking for. And I mentioned, you know, what's happening in social media. How do we make sure we are, uh, you know, catering to the customer what they are looking for? And then gifting. I mean, and Wanda will talk a little bit about gifting later on. And I say, uh, everything in our stores is a gift, right? You shouldn't think about LCBO as a gifting uh, destination only for holiday season. So that is something that, uh, you know, our teams are really focusing on this year. And then uh, lighter choices with the test, what we saw, we saw huge growth there. We plan to expand that and give more options to the uh, uh, customer supporting our moderation impact. You'll hear, I won't talk a lot about Aeroplan because Wanda has a great slide on it later on. 
And then one thing that we've realized people in the last uh, uh, in the last uh, couple of years is kind of didn't have that opportunity to have the physical interaction in terms of experiences as events and tastings. So definitely something that we want to make sure as the province opens up, we are really supporting that as well. Um, and then collaboration to grow local continues to be our mandate of LCBO. That is something that we will always concentrate on. And now more than ever, that is a priority. And then underpinning everything we do here is the spirit of sustainability. And you'll hear a little bit more about it in detail later on from me. Uh, but these are the top priorities that we want to make sure as LCBO we are uh, focusing on in the next coming year. So we introduced Aeroplan into LCBO stores in November of last year. Um, it's going to be launching online this spring as well. Uh, and, and the loyalty program really is a key part of our strategy to be able to deliver a relevant and personalized experience for our customers. It's, it's, it provides us with customer data and insight that really helps us to make uh, business decisions. Um, but also it allows us, along with our trade partners, to create those personalized experiences for customers. And that includes, you know, recommendations and offers. And the program's pretty simple. Um, members earn a point for every $4 that they spend, which they can then redeem for travel and for merchandise through the Aeroplan um, channel, their e-store, and that includes LCB LCBO gift cards as well. And so far, the response from customers and from store staff has been pretty incredible. We've had over 650,000 Aeroplan members transacting in our stores in just the first four months of the program. And then as Abby mentioned, gifting for beverage alcohol also represents a growth opportunity. You know, more and more people now are looking to have experiences versus acquiring more stuff. Um, and beverage alcohol is, it's often associated with celebrations. So we've really been expanding our efforts for year round gifting occasions. And of course the holiday season continues to be one of the biggest ones. And again, just looking at some data from our survey that we did, you can see here that really this focus is resonating with consumers. So 84% of them, 84 of them agree that the LCBO is a gifting destination. Um, so a great place to buy unique and interesting gifts. And if we look at past six month alcohol purchasers, LCBO is considered, you know, the top in, uh, in, in store gifting destination and it's second online just behind Amazon. So, if you look at the overall, you know, growth and especially in the online channel, there's some pretty significant growth here. And if we just talk about digital for a second, I mean, you know, digital innovation is really going to be a key enabler for growth. So we've got some pretty exciting programs uh, underway that are really helping us to bring our brand promise to life in both physical and in virtual ways. So I talked about e-commerce, I talked about loyalty enhancements, and events experiential is also a really important part of the brand experience. Um, we did, we had to move events to the virtual uh, realm as a result of the pandemic. So over the past couple of years, we've hosted 70 virtual events online with over 100,000 views. Um, and we just relaunched our in-person events last week. And we expect that, you know, we'll continue to do virtual experiences. It's just a great way to reach new audiences. But, you know, being able to connect with and engage with our customers and creating those experiences is something that they truly value. Um, and the other uh, program that we're piloting is something called a virtual expert program. Uh, we did a pilot last year. We're actually just working on the second phase of that pilot. I want to share that with you. And then, as I said, I'll walk you through our new flagship store experience as well. So let's look first at the LCBO Virtual Expert. It's really a, you know, a one-to-one -one virtual shopping experience. It allows our customers the opportunity to book appointments and, and engage directly with our product experts, our product consultants that work in our stores. Uh, for the testing of this program, we kept it really simple. We just focused on our Vintage's new release program. We leveraged our product consultants who are all really well versed in Vintage's and who we trained in this virtual selling platform. And then customers had the opportunity just to have 15 or 30 minutes to talk with these experts and to figure out which products they wanted to buy. Um, there's actually a really brief video. If we flip to the next slide, you can see exactly how the experience worked.
a little bit choppy, but hopefully you got a good sense for how it worked. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that really help us to leverage our expertise, leverage the expertise of our partners that we work with in the trade, um, and just give more information to help customers make more informed choices so that they have a better experience, not just with the LCBO, but with the industry in general. So we're working on phase two of that pilot program right now. So let's take a look at our new flagship store experience. We opened our new store on Cooper Street in downtown Toronto in February. Um, there is a video, hopefully it'll play okay, that'll walk you through the experience. Welcome and then I'll come to back the and new Queen's Key LCBO, a flagship store that offers our customers a one-of-a-kind shopping experience. Join us as we take a tour of the store features and the many opportunities to showcase our products to our customers. The store features convenient customer parking, a cold room, and zones for spirits, wine, and vintages, with local features placed strategically within the store. From Queen's Quay, you will enter Vintages, where you'll find the top wines from great regions around the world. From Cooper Street, you'll enter the Spirit Zone, featuring our Cocktail of the Month promotion on the entrance table. You can also go straight to the order pickup desk from this entrance. There are 14 digital displays in five key areas in the store to help drive sales while enhancing customers' experience. The tasting bar features a 98-inch digital screen, which immediately catches customers' attention with immersive tasting experiences, live stream events, and other unique content. In Vintages, there is a 55-inch portrait display with touchscreen capability, amplifying Vintages releases and promotions. The Vintages Tasting Zone offers an enhanced tasting experience for our customers. The zone features a physically accessible kiosk concierge digital screen, providing an inclusive experience for everyone who shops in the store. There are more than 40 end dials throughout the store with a mix of kiosks, discretionary, and promotional ends. These kiosk concierge displays provide our customers with another way to explore our product range and find the perfect choice. The power aisle in the center of the store is where you can find the pop-up shop. With four digital screens, the content here displays curated stories to inspire and inform. The pop-up also includes tasting and personalization opportunities to engage our customers. There are six checkouts at the new store. Three checkouts feature digital screens that highlight impulse products and gift cards, and LCBO messaging on our sustainability efforts, loyalty, and charity initiatives. Also near the cash, the food and drink fixture brings the magazine to life and the gifting fixture is a go-to destination for gift solutions. We know you'll love the new Queen's Key LCBO store, opening this holiday season. So that video was actually created using design drawings. I actually have some photos in the coming pages so you can see the actual space. Um, so I'll just touch on these areas really briefly. So the tasting bar area is going to be a hub of activity for education and customer engagement as soon as we can get back to doing tastings in store. And that digital screen is there to provide some additional information and content. We can also play our virtual event series. The vintage is released, as you saw, so an opportunity for us released, to merchandise our latest wine releases. And that middle screen, you can go to the next slide, Abe. The middle screen is really a, um, it's a touch enabled screen that's going to allow our customers to really explore and learn more about all the new wines that have just come in. As you saw on the kiosk, uh, so really there's five of them placed throughout the store in all the various sections. This is an opportunity, again, if they can't find something they're looking for in the store, they can find it in a nearby store or they can you know, go and order it through the online channel. 
And then our pop-up shop. So really the, that power aisle, creating a great brand moment or installation, an opportunity for us to tell stories. When we launched the store, we actually launched it with a display that was celebrating the Lunar New Year. It's on the next slide, Abby. That's the pop-up shop celebrating the Lunar New Year. And then you can go to the next slide and you heard about the displays at cash, really an opportunity to engage with customers, create maybe some trial and impulse opportunities, or just an opportunity for us to reinforce some of our key messages, whether it's about our fundraising efforts, about joining the loyalty program, or our standards as a responsible retailer. So we'll use the learnings from this store uh, really to influence the design of our future stores. And hopefully you'll all find an opportunity to visit this new store next time you're in downtown Toronto. As I said, so far, the feedback from customers and from staff has really been very positive. I'll turn it back to Abby. Thank you, Rhonda. That is indeed a very beautiful store. It, uh, it makes you feel like shopping all the time when you're there. Um, you know, we are towards the end of our presentation and we kind of spoke a lot about spirit of sustainability. And, you know, it really is something that we truly believe in. And it really has the three P's, the people, planet, and partnership. From a good people perspective, you know, it focuses on improving the well-being of customers, employees, and communities across Ontario. You know, it has a moderation mandate. We want to make sure that, you know, LCBO is providing the responsible options and making positive drinking choice that's supposed to help the lifestyle thriving communities. We want to help build communities where people have equitable access to essential resources, you know, regardless of gender, age, sex, uh, you know, ethnicity, ability, language, sexual orientation. And then our employees are so important. We want to make sure they're engaged. We want to support uh, and energize and mobilize employee population who feels connected to this mission and the values of our organization. And, you know, they're physically and mentally supported and empowered uh, to achieve their goals. And that is something we truly believe in. And then the second thing that we really concentrate on is a good planet, which really talks about practices that minimize the environmental impacts on a business that our business creates. I mean, a supply chain, it, it is, uh, it's done in a way that really establishes the environmentally conscious standards across the production, transportation, and distribution of product. If you haven't heard about lightweight glass, something that we uh, rolled out some time ago, which really helped us reduce the carbon footprint uh, of moving the product from one location to another. And then the waste and energy reduction, we, you know, we want to advance practices that reduce the energy that is used, the waste generated by our business operations and, and our product offerings. And then the third, and the, one of the most important P's of this whole spirit of sustainability is good partnerships, because we want to, um, you know, drive positive change. We want to be the catalyst that drives positive change within an industry. Uh, I, I think, you know, we we want to empower the industry to promote inclusive social and environmental practices, and then share that knowledge uh, so that uh, we are able to make our industry more sustainable. We want to recognize good partners who champion in making strides through diversity, inclusion, community investment. And we see that partnership when we do pride campaigns and many other campaigns across throughout the year. And then enhance that industry diversity. We are committed to utilizing our resources, uh, you know, to provide opportunities to uh, for diversity within the industry. And, and if you follow LCBO, uh, you will see there's a lot of initiatives that we really embarked upon to really make sure this particular, uh, you know, enhancing that industry diversity is on top of our mind. But as I talk about partnership, I want to really talk about one of the biggest partnerships we've had uh, in the last 25 years. That is with the domestic wines at LCBO. You know, we, we, if we, when I asked the team to pull these numbers, I was amazed that we really we have seen five times the sales in the last 20 years. Uh, five years and then we have really doubled the product offerings as well as the number of wineries that we uh, purchased from in the last 25 years and that continues to remain a huge uh, mandate for us and that doesn't just go away because we we are committed to providing unique support uh, to elevate and grow Ontario wine sales uh, you know there's many ways that we do this that we want uh, that provide the enhanced support to the local industry our wine country boutiques there are 20 stores that have enhanced product selection and these stores have unique products such as unique fine and wines to watch uh, program where we buy specific frontline products for these stores 
the buyer picks. I know it's an aeroplane based buyer pick program. Two, three SKUs, parts paid per period in LCBO wines. Go local. It's a highly coveted free display for four to five SKUs each period with a strong promotional offer. And then VQA staff tasting program. I know it was on hold because of COVID, but we are ready to activate it soon. And you know, for these programs, we consider SKUs on promo, aligned with overall marketing theme. And then we just cannot forget the P7 Ontario wine uh, promotion that we do. That is huge. And something I'll share with you later on uh, really ties everything together. And then the Wild Leader program, the, the retail training uh, program that will be re-implemented, which had taken a pause because of COVID, to provide critical business updates and showcase what is trending in Ontario wines. And uh, you know, for those uh, small niche products from the niche Ontario regions, the Ontario Wine Direct, Direct Delivery Program, that really supports the assortment that we can provide to our customer. So as you can see, you know, supporting local continues to be our mandate. And on the next slide, I, I and I'll have to go off the video because I want to make sure you see this video because it's a, one of the one of my favorite videos in the whole presentation is it's, uh, the way I would like to end this presentation is uh, sharing this campaign video with you that LCB had put together in the very early days of pandemic, not only to support Ontario wine industry, but a lot of local businesses, uh, small businesses. And, uh, you know, I'll let the video do the talking. And then uh, after the video, we'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. So I'm going to go off the video here myself so that I can stream this. During a year no one could prepare for, small businesses across the country were struggling to survive. We know COVID-19 is having a disastrous impact on the economy. With bars, restaurants, and makers being some of the hardest hit, the LCBO's mission has always been to help support Ontario. But how do you ask people to buy something from you during one of the worst economic downturns in history? You don't. You ask people to buy something from someone else. Introducing Pair It Forward, a campaign designed to start a chain reaction of local support across the province. By taking what we make and pairing it with what our neighbors make. Shot in 24 locations across Ontario, small businesses began pairing it forward to one another. We love to pair our cheese with an organic salad from Royal Acres Farm. Thanks a lot, Ruth. And if you want to see more, our produce and our edible flowers are featured in all the wonderful dishes at the Pine. Thanks, Jenny. Your produce really brings our dishes to life. So I hope to see how we're pairing it for and how you can show your support. Using geotags and newly launched small business stickers to help users discover those worth supporting, leading Canadians to show their support by creating and sharing their own local pairings. Pairing an Ontario product with another Ontario product, highlighting local businesses, pair it forward. I love that. The campaign garnered 56 million impressions and counting, and a 43% increase in new customers, with up to an 87% sales lift for featured local producers. But most importantly, helping Ontario recover, one pairing at a time. Because the best thing to pair with my Ontario product is someone else's. Thank you, Vonda and Abe, for that informative presentation. Uh, the history of the LCBO, the five trends you presented, the sustainability initiatives, and in particular, the, the local supports for winemakers and other, other small businesses across Ontario was really interesting to me. And I look forward to checking out the new downtown store. I'm curious mm -hmm. about the feedback you receive will reshape the look of future stores. So um, we'll start the Q&A portion of the session here. So I have, I have a couple queued up. So I'll start with, with the growth in Bubbles and Rosé wines you mentioned, but with European wines taking sales away from VQA, do you have any insights as to why Ontario VQA wines are not competing as well in, in this category? 
against the European producers. So the, 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 the metric I shared was really compared to the year before, which was the height of pandemic. So we saw for the first year of pandemic, there was a huge support. So the way I really look at it is it was in super inflated and now it's kind of normalizing. So European is kind of taking it now, but it really is compared to exceptionally high numbers the year before. That's where you see the difference in there. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, VQ doesn't uh, produce some great, uh, uh, you know, rosé and bubbles. It's just the way we compare the first year of pandemic because the support for local was so huge. Uh, we blew through the plan numbers for the first year, and that's why you're seeing that uh, negative uh, decrease uh, in the numbers there. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, so. This next question fits in with local. Uh, so what type of alcoholic beverages have benefit, benefited the most from the consumer shift to local products? And do you think that these trends will continue? I, I think there is, and I, you know, I'll, I'll let Wanda add a few things. I, I think that the, the, the support for local continues. I don't think this trend is going away. Uh, I think, uh, you know, if we really look around, um, you know, our, our family friends, uh, and you will see a lot of them talk about the brewery down the street, the winery that they love to buy from, the direct winery. And I think what people have done is discovered a lot of products and now they're sticking to a lot of these things. So I don't think that the trends will go away. We definitely saw a huge uh, increase in wine uh, in the first year of pandemic from a local perspective, uh, but there are some great distillers out there, uh, uh, craft distillers that have done exceptionally well as well. Uh, because they were doing home delivery, people didn't want to go into the stores, and they were like small distillery. I mean, if you really go online, a lot of these distillers and brewers and wineries were doing at-home delivery at that time for a lot of our customers. So uh, I think wine has probably benefited the most. The big growth we saw was in distillers, uh, more so than anything else. But this trend is there to stay, because from what Wanda's team has done the research, the customer is not moving away from the support of local. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, Abe. I think there was a lot of discovery going on. Yeah. I think people were trying not just different varieties of wines. I think they were trying different brands of wines that they hadn't tried before. And I think a big part of what we're trying to do to evolve uh, this campaign as well is last year we spent a lot of time talking about the different Ontario producing regions. So to help customers really get informed and educated about the different types of wines that come out of the different regions of Ontario. And again, I think that's just to get them to continue to explore and discover. But I, I would say probably, you know, following the same trends as the market overall, Abby, I think it's fair to say that rosés within Ontario probably experienced some pretty strong growth. Yeah. yeah. How has the legalization of cannabis and perhaps cannabis infused drinks affected the LCBO and its products? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't, I don't know, Abby, if you, I, I, we don't have any data specifically on this, but it is something that we've been talking about um, is how to measure or how to look at the market holistically, right? Because you're going to have a segment of customers that engage in both of those industries, and then you're going to have a, a segment of customers that only engages in one. And we've been talking about it also in the context of those younger audiences where we were talking earlier. Abby, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, that is right. But I think when we look at trends, uh, because, you know, when cannabis was legalized, I mean, uh, you know, if uh, I think it was George, our uh, present CEO, George had come and spoken in one of the Kobe lectures. He really talked about during the time when cannabis was being launched. And we really didn't know how this would impact. And we were looking at sales and was it beer that they were losing a market share to an RTD? The truth is, it's we don't know because all of those categories are growing. So, yeah. uh, you know, RTD, as I shared, has an explosive growth. I mean, if you really think about that younger generation moving from RTD to cannabis, we haven't really seen that impact in our categories. I'm sure there is some, but we are just not seeing a negative impact. I also think the pandemic kind of messed things up a bit, yeah. right? Because we're not in a we're not in a normal period. So I think this is something that we will continue to look at as we come out of the pandemic. Okay, a question about um, equitable practices. Does the LCBO examine the equitable practices of its suppliers with the same criteria it uses internally? 
I, I wonder, I can take that actually. I, I actually, uh, you know, was, uh, I'm part of the, uh, the Inclusive Leadership Council in LCBO. And one of our things that we are really looking to do is how do we actually uh, have diverse suppliers as well? Now, we are definitely uh, mandated and driven by a lot of regulation that uh, procurement regulation that doesn't really help us specify a lot of those things. That being said, we recently actually launched uh, an addition to a supplier code of conduct that really talks about, um, you know, our expectation from our suppliers to be equitable, inclusive, and diverse and follow practices that are aligned with ours. Uh, so it might not really talk about within the procurement practices, but that is our expectation from a supplier code of conduct. Uh, you talk about a brand promise of perfect choices made easy, moments made great. How are you ensuring staff are friendly and go-to experts? That's a really good, really good point because it's not just about the marketing, it's about the experience that you actually have in the store. Um, so I can tell you, we work in very close partnership with our chief retail officer. Um, John Summers actually joined the company about six months ago, and he is a really big believer in brands and, and in creating brand experiences. And so he has a team of folks that actually um, kind of take whatever the point of view is and whatever the priorities are for every single promotional period that we do throughout the year, and they turn it into training materials for our staff. And so what happens is it's kind of like a train the trainer kind of program where the, the insight is cascaded down from, you know, all different levels uh, and it reaches the individuals at the store levels because those are the ones that are really on the front lines that are serving our customers every day. So we have a pretty robust training program that does that. Um, and we are continuing to look at how do we introduce digital enhancements that make it even easier for our staff on the front line to access information that they can then use when they're engaging with our customers. So speaking of digital, you mentioned some uh, new things such as same day pickup, your relationship with Aeroplan, some virtual experiences. So, and you may have touched a bit on this, but what changes have been made to the digital aspect of the shopping experience that um, is said to be unique to LCBO? Um, well, I, I don't know if it's unique or not unique, but I think this whole connection of when you think about the customer journey in engaging with us, it's one customer across all those different touch points, right? It's not like it's a different customer that's going on the website versus seeing us in social media versus, you know, calling our customer care center versus going to the store. And so what we're trying to create in terms of that experience is how do you make it so that they have a consistent experience across all those different touch points? How do you introduce um, functions that make it easier for them to find what they're looking for, easier for them to reach out and get advice or expertise when they need it? And I think what the loyalty program is going to enable us to do is if this customer chooses to share their information with us, then we'll know who they are, you know, whether they're on our website or calling us or coming into our stores. The vision for the future is that we know who you are as a customer, which enables us to better serve you. And if you think about digital in that way, it's using technology really to integrate all of those different touch points and to create, um, you know, just ease of experience, ease of access, if I want to create, you know, a profile that says, here's all my favorite beverages. Now tell me, based on that, what are some other things that I might like, right? Like all those, all those engines just to bring that artificial intelligence to give recommendations. You're going to start to see some of that show up on the new website experience and the new mobile app experience, but we're really at the beginning of it. Okay, great. Uh, that seems to be all the questions for today, so thank you. Unless uh, you each have some more to say, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and to everyone who joined us virtually. 
Today's lecture will be posted shortly to our website at brockuca forward slash covey, that's C-C-O-V-I. And you can also find out more about the lecture, lecture, lecture series as a whole on that website. Uh, so there's two lectures coming up for 2020, and that's on Monday, March 28th, Belinda Kemp, Covey Senior Enologist, presenting the magic of mushrooms, the potential use of mushroom-derived materials in the winery. And then on Monday, April 4th, wine writer, author, Ronald Jackson on wine and food, perfect marriage or myth. So um, do you have any additional comments, Vonda or Abhay, before we leave? I, I was just going to say thank you so much for the opportunity and for the invitation to come and speak and share some of the things that we're doing and some of the things that we're seeing uh, for the industry ahead. And I hope everyone found this informative. I definitely did. So thank you so much. I hope everybody has a great day. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.